Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sunday's Other Scriptures for January 14th. We are in the season of Epiphany, wherein Jesus is gradually revealed in our gospel readings each week. More and more, he is revealed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And our gospel reading for this Sunday is uh, uh, one that we don't hear every year, but uh, it's definitely the beginning of that. It's uh, Nathaniel, who's a skeptical about Jesus being the Messiah because he's from this backwater called Nazareth, kind of a competing small town to Bethsaida, where Nathaniel is from. And uh, also because uh, there's no Old Testament reference to the Messiah coming from Nazareth. Uh, everybody knows he was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, and uh, that wasn't widely known about Jesus. And so, uh, and 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 also that seems to be the character of Nathaniel. He he says it like he sees it, and Jesus reveals that he knows that about Nathaniel before Nathaniel has ever met him. Uh, he gives kind of a backhanded compliment to Nathaniel that he's a, a true Israelite in whom there's no guile or deceit. And uh, Nathaniel says, well, how do you know me? We, we haven't met. And uh, Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, to you and me, that's just like, uh, okay, you've got good vision, Jesus. Way, way to go. Good eyesight there. But this was actually a powerful symbol. Uh, four of the Old Testament prophets used this idea of an Israelite sitting under his fig tree. Uh, the idea was in the Messianic age, every Israelite would uh, have his own fig tree to sit underneath, and he would have uh, time to to rest there and to study uh, God's word, to reflect on God's goodness. It was it was like an idealized image. Uh, sometimes every every Israelite would have their own vine and fig tree, and uh, and and what it reveals that Nathaniel was sitting under this fig tree is that he was someone who was deeply interested in the coming of the Messiah, in the coming of God's kingdom. And Jesus grasps this, and he uh, clearly states it to Nathaniel, that he knows what it's about that Nathaniel was sitting under that fig tree. And you'll notice that Nathaniel does a 180, immediately says, you know, you are the Christ, the Son of God. This is an early recognition of who Jesus is uh, before really Peter or some of the main disciples grasped it. We get this spin coming out of uh, Nathaniel because Jesus is fulfilling what was predicted, uh, not just predicted of the Messiah, but a characteristic of God. And that leads us to our other scriptures for this Sunday. The first scripture is taken from the beginning of 1 Samuel, where Samuel, we, we get the backstory of how Samuel ended up as a child being uh, sent to the temple to be mentored by Eli, uh, the priest there. And I say temple, but actually it was the tabernacle. The temple hadn't been built yet. Uh, it was this big tent of meeting. The Israelites were in the process still of trying to conquer and, and hold on to uh, the promised land, which was promised to them, but occupied by the Canaanites when they first encountered it. And, uh, and, and so God's, the place of worship is wherever the tabernacle, this big tent of meeting is moved. And that's where Eli serves as priest. That's where uh, Samuel is sent to be apprenticed to Eli as a, uh, as a gift of gratitude by Samuel's parents for giving them uh, a child and not leaving them barren. And even though he's being raised in the tabernacle, uh, Samuel doesn't recognize the voice of the Lord. When he calls to him in the quiet and the stillness of the night, he thinks it's Eli calling to him. And this is our first lesson. Uh, and I think it's really instructive to us that just being in the church doesn't mean you're necessarily listening for or recognizing the voice of God. But it's put in these particular readings because it indicates that God knows us before we knew him. He knows us by name. He has a future for us. And there's a great parallel to uh, the gospel reading in which um, Jesus not only knows Nathaniel, but you'll notice at the end of the gospel reading, Jesus uh, predicts uh, what is going to occur, among other things, in, in Nathaniel's life. He uses, uh, Jesus uses an image from Jacob, from the story of, of Jacob in the Old Testament. And, and you know, it's clear that Nathaniel's well-versed in the Hebrew scriptures. And uh, Jesus uses that to indicate that Nathaniel's deep desire for the messianic kingdom to see it actualized is going to be met. 
And uh, in the story of Samuel, uh, Samuel isn't revealed uh, in this particular section yet, but God is going to raise him up to be the first really great prophet of Israel. He's going to be the one who is going to um, uh, anoint uh, as king of Israel, the first king, Saul, and the first good king, David. Uh, and, uh, and Samuel is really going to be a powerful agent of God. And God knew him already and knew his future when Samuel was a boy. Now, our second reading, the responsive reading, is uh, a portion of Psalm 139. And in this section uh, of this psalm written by King David, uh, we have David reflecting on and rejoicing in the fact that God sees him and, and that God knows him. As David said, God searches him out and knows his every thought. And so we echo that because we believe that that's true of us as well. And then the second part of this section uh, is uh, David rejoicing in the fact that you can't go anywhere to get away from God's spirit, that he is with you wherever. This was a deep dread of ancient people, that if you are if you were lost at sea, your body would become fish food and there would be no resurrection for you. And, you know, it's just so desolate. Um, to this day, a lot of people uh, really feel that if, if your future generations don't know where they uh, are buried, or if something should happen and their body was never recovered, that somehow that that means that that you're lost to everyone. And uh, the psalm assures us that you're never lost to God. He always knows where you are. And, and not only does he know where you are, uh, but it ends this section by saying, even even there, no matter where I go, uh, you know, in the sea, the highest height, the, the greatest depth, uh, he, he says, if I rise on the wings of dawn, that is to the east, or settle on the far side of the sea, the sea was to the west, east or west, um, even there your hand will guide me, uh, your right hand will hold me fast. So that's a great assurance that we have. And then the epistle lesson, uh, which is, uh, it's it's the one that states most clearly where I'm going in the sermon uh, in some ways, because it Paul clearly argues to the Christians in Corinth that we belong to God and not just our spirits, our bodies as well. And this is because our bodies were, of course, created by God. They're his workmanship, therefore they belong to him, but also because he he redeemed our bodies that is, he, uh, we died with Christ and we, we rose again, and uh, he's going to resurrect our bodies. We don't believe we'll just be airy spirits in nothingness forever. And, uh, and, and Paul is making the argument that because our bodies belong to God, because, as he says, you were bought at a price, including your body, um, we should flee sexual immorality. Because all other sins a man commits, he says, occur outside the body. But when you sin sexually, uh, that is a sin against your body. And your body is meant to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? God is is not only with us in his spirit wherever we go, but he's with us in our bodies wherever we go. Uh, that's where God dwells. That's that's how God works through us, is he works through our bodies, our ability to speak and to see and to touch each other and work for each other and go to each other. That's how God works through us. And, and therefore, since our bodies are the temple, of the Holy Spirit, the, our bodies are the place where God works. Um, because of that, we ought to honor God with our bodies and honor our bodies as God's temple. So this is kind of an extension of that. Now where I'm going in the sermon is I'm talking about Christian identity. And these are all parts of our identity, aren't they? That we belong to God as part of our identity. And therefore we belong to each other in a sense because of that. And, and a big part of that belonging that I, I think we don't pay enough attention to is that belonging uh, implies knowledge, right? The people who know us best are the people we belong to the most. And no one knows us better than God does. That's why we belong to him. So I hope this gives you a, a lot to think about and discuss. The Lord bless you this week.